Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. I am Elizabeth Duzak, and I am going to serve a little bit as a moderator today. I'm excited about this uh, conversation to um, talk about the open course data. Many of you may know and may have even participated in the open course that um, the Student Affairs Assessment Leaders has been offering for the past three years. And this is a neat chance to not only hear about that data and talk about the implications, but also to hopefully model for you all um, what that looks like when you've got um, people who have been doing data analysis stuff, um, talking to the instructors of the course on uh, what that means and how they can use it and future directions. And so we're gonna get started today. We have um, Joe and Ben as instructors, and then Joe and Vince as data analysis people. Um, and Renee uh, isn't able to join us today, but participated in a lot of the data analysis. Um, so we'll get started. Feel free to chat at any point and uh, looking forward to today's conversation. All right, thanks Elizabeth. Uh, Want to just set the agenda for folks here. Um, whether you're familiar or not with the course, uh, what we're gonna do is, is dive into the data that, that uh, we looked at for the course, which um, we had a welcome survey, which captured some demographic information about the participants. Uh, we had a closing uh, end of course survey, which captured some behaviors uh, of the students in the course. Uh, we wanted to share some completion data with you all. We did some analysis on the quiz data uh, in terms of uh, how students scored on, on the questions. And then in light of all of that data, um, you know, we have Ben and myself here as instructors who have looked over this information and then are thinking about you know, our takeaways and, and our thoughts of what that could mean in terms of making improvements to the course. I uh, want to remind you what we're hoping you all take away is knowing uh, the course data that was analyzed, um, being able to think about some of the big takeaways or, or summarize the findings from the data that we analyzed and think about to be able to describe at least two of the implications that, that we're um, looking for data improvement for the course, which those could also be things that you all see. And so that's, you know, to Elizabeth's point, you know, please feel free to, to chat in your thoughts, insights, questions, um, because, you know, this is very much a, a community course. We have so many people that have participated in it and uh, we welcome you all as, as active uh, stakeholders here in the process as well. But as we look to get started, I'm going to turn it over to Vince, who uh, did the survey analysis. So I'll let him talk through that. And Vince, if I, I'll try and advance the slide, but feel free to cue me if I'm slow. Okay, okay. Thank you, Joe. First, I'm really honored to be here talking with all of these really smart people about our course data. And I think you can click now. Yeah, there we go. So uh, with regard to gender, we can see about 75% or three fourths of our completers are women over both years for which we have reliable data. That shifted a percentage point up from 2018 to this year, okay? And then the, the main thing for me here is that 75 to 80% of our completers are between 25 and 54 years of age. And then an additional 10% are between the ages of 55 to 64. So we don't get many that are um, under 25 and we don't get many that are close to retirement age completing our course. Okay. And one note I just want to make for our readers, and sorry, I probably should have said this before handing off to Vin, is uh, the large image, the large graphic is the data from 2019. Uh, the smaller graphic is the data from 2018. Um, we did have a 2017 launch, but we at least just wanted to show the comparison to last year, but just for your orientation as you're looking, the, the big graph is from this year and the smaller one is. Thank you, Joe. That's just something that we knew and I just forgot that nobody else would know that. <clears throat> so uh, on the referrals slide, we dropped 20 percentage points in terms of people that heard from friends or colleagues, that being our top source from last year to this year. And, but that 20% of the people were accounted for this year by basically the internet, with a few 4% hearing about the course from an instructor. 
uh, geographic location slide, this is my favorite slide. The Asia Pacific region stepped up and claimed four percentage points from North America. Now, selfishly, I like to think that was some of my personal influence because I was in the middle of the Pacific Ocean touting our course to colleagues, some of who completed it. <laughs> okay. Uh, the learner type slide. Um, so there's nothing, nothing significant here, but it is surprising to me that passive learners make up the bulk of our completers, same as last year. However, in this, I didn't talk about this earlier, but I noticed it this morning. This is the least insignificant of the non-significant <laughs> influencers on our data. So if we were looking at this from a 10% uh, 0.10 confidence interval, it would be. But the, the uh, F statistic would not be um, high enough. But it's, it's, so again, it's marginally insignificant. So that may be of note to some of the instructors later on. Thank you, Joe. Then the, uh, this is our biggie. If we have a biggie, people that have jobs in which assessment takes up more than 80% of the time on task are the only group that have more completers than non-completers. So if we want to up our completion stats, that's the group to whom we should probably market. And I'll show those uh, stats on a later slide. Okay. Not really a lot to see here, other than 60% of the completers have master's degrees. It wasn't significant, but it's a clear majority. But we include the doctoral um, degree holders. We see that the bulk of our completers do have advanced degrees. Okay. So um, we had more self-described beginners than last year. We had fewer self-described intermediate learners than last year. And we had a smidgen more people claiming to be advanced assessors. Again, not significant in our outcomes. Institution type slide, this, this really surprises me. I always expect this to have a significant um, effect, but it doesn't. We saw a slight shift in the numbers of people from community colleges to four-year private schools, but none of that was significant. Okay. So one thing I do want to do since um, we're, we're doing great on time is just see before we then dive into the closing survey, if anybody has any questions, comments uh, that they want to share or ask about now, uh, about the welcome survey. You can do so later, and some of you might be like, well, I wanna see if there's this other information later, which is totally fine, but I just wanted to pause, uh, and we'll do this between each data set just to see if anybody has any um, things to share. Otherwise, there'll be ample time for discussion um, after we get through the data sets, but I figured I'd see if anybody has anything. I'm not seeing anything coming through, but um, we can always address after Vince goes through the closing survey data too. All right. Okay, you can click the next one, please, sir. So for the end of the course shift, the end of course survey shift, there's really not much that changed in any of these slides. Um, so I'm just gonna go through them really quickly and let you look at those. And uh, we use chi-square test. I saw that question pop up. It disappeared, but I saw the first sentence of it. So um, I'll, I'll show you those in just a bit, too. We've got a slide with that. So as you see, th there you go. Thank you. The length recommendations really didn't change very much. You can continue to go um, in structure interaction preference. Not much change there. Uh, people like variety. Here's where we had a little bit of a Bump, though uh, we got more five-star reviews we increased 14 percentage points in terms of how many people gave us the percentage of people who gave us uh, five-star reviews and then um, you know those basically came from the four-star review people so we changed their minds we're glad to see that good job instructors yay okay thanks Joe this again here, no, nothing changed, nothing significant about it. Uh, most people would recommend the course. The time spent on the course, you would think, I would think that would be significant, but it's really not. And there was no really, not a big shift from one year to the next. Again, nothing really shifty about this. It's pretty consistent. 
just go ahead, Jeff. Uh, there was basically agreement that the, um, the materials have a positive impact. So that was good. And that stayed the same across both years. Okay. Okay. So Joe, I think you'll do one slide and then I'll talk about the other two a little bit. Yeah. So when it comes to completion, we want to brag on ourselves a little bit uh, in the sense that you know, we've been doing this course uh, three times now, and um, our first launch of the course had our most people signed up. Uh, we had over 2,500 people sign up, um, but believe it or not, we had less than 252 people complete. Uh, so, or I'm sorry, we, we did have close to, um, we had close to 300 people complete, but given that we had almost 3,000 people sign up, um, that number shrank a little bit, but uh, this past year, 2018 to 2019, was a bit more um, comparable in terms for, for this year, where, you know, last year we had similar amount of students, and but we had more people complete this year, and we're pretty excited about the completion rate, because for anybody that's familiar with MOOCs or Massive Open Online Courses, they tend to have a completion rate around 5% as an average, um, some up to 10%, but you know, seeing a near 20% completion rate is pretty rare uh, with, with MOOCs. So we're pretty proud of that and, and something that um, at least the past two years we've seen fairly steady, which yeah, is exciting for us. Okay, so this was respond, responding to a question I saw flash across. What test did we run? So Ben did some matching in SPSS, and I had run some a cross tabs command in PSPP, which is the free Linux version of the same, same basic thing. And so this is the only thing that showed significance at the 0.05 level after we looked at the chi square um, slide. So you see people that the only group right here on the bottom, I don't know if you see the 81 to 100% count there, the last uh, row in those columns, 16 people completed and 14 didn't. That was the only group in those five categories of uh, data that had more completers than non-completers. And so, it, so then you look at that and you say, well, was that a significant difference? Okay, Joe, if you wanna click the next slide, we'll look at that for just a bit. So yes, it was. So the uh, the out the value here was fourteen point two three, and that's an actual computed value from SPSS. So um, we know by by looking at that that it's it's significant because we're not we're not having to compare that to a a, a chart in a book. And so that what that can tell us is that. Um, it's, it's a significant difference in these categorical variables. It's not chance that these people who were focused on assessment and 80% of their work, that they completed more often than the people who didn't have that much of their work, depending on doing assessment. So, and, and just in summary, again, there was no significant difference by education level, assessment competency level, online learner type, the reason for taking the course, hours planning to spend on coursework, gender, age, institution, type, where the student lived, or English as a first language. The only thing that was significant was the percent of the role dedicated to assessment. If I could jump in here just for a second, Vince, um, just to give a little bit more detail. Um, uh, I, um, we, we're just looking at completion rates here, you know, kind of a categorical, did they complete or not? This does not account for students who, um, you know, did part of the course or use some of the resources and then, you know, um, went elsewhere, got what they needed, which I, I think there's reason to believe a decent amount of our students have a specific reason for, you know, uh, coming to the course and, and finding specific resources. So this is like full completion, which had certain standards for uh, the quiz performance and, and uh, um, working through the whole course. And Joe, if, you, if you're able to go back one slide, um, I thought an interesting point here is to look at 
the majority, so 53% of non-completers um, have zero to 20% of their job affiliated with assessment. So to me, that was a really standout um, pattern here, considering that we're asking questions of how, how do we kind of cater our course to the audience appropriately? How do we support our students, particularly within the MOOC environment? What does that look like? Um, because this course is catered to assessment professionals, we should see a decent amount of folks who are coming in with a, uh, a lot of assessment responsibilities, but that's not always the case, of course. I mean, you can see um, that still the largest uh, category for as far as percentage of assessment dedicated, um, sorry, percent of role dedicated to assessment work is still that zero to 20%. So uh, now these are folks who all took the welcome survey. This doesn't capture everybody in the MOOC, um, but just a couple of just small detail things to consider there um, as we proceed. Yeah, and I would just add, you know, it, that's one of the things in, in looking at this course, um, both from an instructor perspective and even from a, a student affairs assessment leader, Sal perspective that gets interesting is the merit and the, the impact that the course has. And uh, to, to Ben's most recent point, sometimes the, the only data we have is from the people that complete the surveys, both the, the, the welcome as well as the end. Likewise, um, you know, we appreciate the, the good completion numbers that we have. But we also have marketed the course in a way that we invite people to come even if they just need a little help in a very specific assessment area. And so those people, uh, getting to this majority here, those people are sometimes the ones who maybe don't even come close to finishing the class because all they wanna do is get a resource on a specific thing that, that the course covers. And so what's unfortunate and, and something you know outside of this analysis that you know, we, we need to think about is how best to try and capture that because we know that there are some people who log into the course, they register for the course, and they get this great nugget of information that really helps them in their job or on their campus. But if that was the only thing they needed, they you know, wouldn't necessarily persist and complete the course. Uh, they might not also take either of the surveys and we may never ultimately hear that success story, um, which is something that, you know, we're we're aware of and thinking about, but but also just an interesting component of the nature of the MOOC as well as the, the the resource we're providing, and we're happy that occurs because you know our underlying purpose in providing this is making sure people have access to free resources. But I think we also would love to know the extent that's happening and the impact and reach that the course has beyond completion, and so that's that's one of the things around this completion data piece that isn't explicit, but I know as instructors, we, we think about, and even from the SOL perspective, we think about um, with, with people taking advantage of the resource and, and our other resources as well. That's all I have, Joe, so you can continue with the other slides. Thank you, Ben, for jumping in there. That's great information. Okay, so I see there have been a couple, or at least the statistical test question came across. Um, as other people have other comments, questions about the, um, the data, feel free to, to ask it and we'll look to respond as we go. Um, I'm now gonna be channeling Renee uh, because she's the one that did all the quiz data analysis. Um, and unfortunately, she wasn't able to be here with us, but she did provide um, some good context and narrative. So I will do my best to do her work justice. But yeah, she was our, our person that, that dug into the, the quiz data. So, you know, for, as I look to show some slides here, uh, it's important to understand what we were looking for. So each of, the, there's eight modules in the, quit, in the course, seven of them have a quiz, the eighth one does not. Um, and so there's seven quizzes. Uh, as Ben was alluding to from a completion perspective, in order to earn the statement of accomplishment for the course, you have to get a 75% or better on all of the quizzes. Um, students have three tries to do that. 
um, and the, the, system, the course takes your best score. Um, and so knowing that 75% benchmark, uh, what Renee looked into was those people who score 75% or higher for each of the modules um, and two variables that were computed to determine per item success uh, and the percent of those answering these questions incorrectly. So the first variable was computed to find the percentage of students who answered each item correctly. And the second variable was to find the percentage of students who answered incorrectly. That way we know um, how students are doing for each of the questions. And this first slide here, well, all of the data were summarized in an Excel spreadsheet and we use that to, to make some visuals here. And so the, the images that you'll see are some of those high level visuals. Um, and we'll call out some specific areas where there was more struggling or more people answering questions incompletely uh, than, than not. Uh, so we'll call those out. And there's certain modules, even as you're looking at this slide, you probably see um, the lowest are you know, module two, five, and seven. And we'll share more about that in a bit. And so here's just the another way of looking at that data with, with some additional information around standard deviation. But um, what we found really was that modules two, five, and seven as a whole posed some challenges uh, to the participants uh, where the most challenging questions were ones where people were asked to apply the concepts uh, that might have been found in other modules. Um, and we'll point out some of those questions specifically. It's also important to note the end there. And so again, thinking about the full course, we had over 1,200 people signed up, uh, only 252. Um, that 252 represents people who uh, took all of the quizzes. So there were certainly people who took some of the first couple quiz modules or some of the latter ones, or maybe they only attended you know, one, one module uh, here or there because the course was completely open. That 252 number represents people who um, took all of the quizzes. So what's not included here are the people who maybe, you know, we, we, we have more people who maybe completed the quiz for module one and in module seven or the other ones in between. Uh, but I wanted to explain that, that end number there. So this is the type of uh, data that we then shared back um, throughout our organization and with the instructors where you can see uh, in orange, that's a percent of people who missed a question and blue are the percent of people who answered correctly. And so you can see that other than question one, um, the questions are typically answered correctly in this module. Module two, so this is the one where it was our first kind of big dip looking at the overall data. Uh, you can see that there's a couple questions here where the percent of people answering it incorrectly is over 20 percent um, and so the pieces in particular were here uh, as you can see by the numbers um, and down here and as alluded to before these were questions that were less about looking at a definition or recalling a definition of content that was covered in the module, more about application of that content to a specific circumstance or, or situation. For module three, uh, there were a few that, you know, there's one at 20% and one at 27%. Um, but otherwise, a lot of the questions were answered below 10% with incorrect. Module four had two areas above 20%. You can see there. So module five was the next big area of concern or, or overall module that that had uh, some big issues, as you can see that question number one. Now, what's a little misleading about that question number one is this makes it appear as if this, this, the quiz just had two questions. This is a bit of a, um, 
Um, it's no more for the actual way the quiz is set up. So Canvas had treats question one as one big question, but it has several subcomponents to it. And so that's why you know this this looks like it's just one big question, but it actually had a number of elements underneath it. And so we can see then those individual elements where people uh, were struggling. It also, just given the nature of its setup, um, outright <laughs> thinking we should maybe set it up a little differently and break up those pieces to be unique questions uh, so that we can have that more um, overall awareness of, of how students are doing without having to dig a little deeper and um, and maybe the multi-layered nature of the question uh, also posed some challenges for the folks. Here are the results for module six. Again, there's a couple there over 20%. And again, these are also some specific applications of content from the module to a circumstance or a situation or uh, data that was actually provided. In module seven here, you can see again, uh, a number of questions well above 20% uh, where students were answering incorrectly. Um, you know, these first three here, and this bottom one, the bottom ones were particularly concerning. Um, and so I'll pause here slash slip shift to the next slide as we talk a bit more about high level implications of all this data, but just to stick uh, quickly with the quiz questions, um, this was something that we've looked at this data each term and um, made some tweaks to the questions as well as each term as we've made tweaks to the content of the course, we've looked to make sure the quiz questions still best correspond to that. Um, but I think what's awesome about Renee's analysis here was it was a little deeper and again just presented a lot clearer than some of the ways we've individually dug into this data for, for the respective modules. And so this was really eye-opening to compare module to module. Um, and identify the most uh, troubling areas for us to, to focus. So we're going to shift that. So I'm going to take off my Renee hat uh, of, of walking through the quiz data and um, also my other just analysis person hat and put on my instructor hat to uh, join Ben in giving some feedback or reactions that we've had uh, as we've looked into this information and, and considered our efforts with the course so far, as well as where we think it could go moving forward. Um, but since I've just been talking, I'll turn it over to Ben to, to kick off here with, with some feedback and reactions. And as we're talking, um, please uh, share your, your questions, your comments, um, because as we, you know, thinking back to the agenda slide, this is our last big chunk of the, the presentation. Um, and then we'll turn it over to just invite uh, Q&A from, from people. But feel free to start um, thinking about your, your comments, questions, and, and sharing them here, which you can pose to instructors or uh, to Vince. Uh, and I can do my best to represent Renee from the analysis side of what she did. But turn it over to Ben. Great. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I mean, I think there's probably a lot that we can talk about here, probably maybe even more than um, we would have time for today. But I think drawing out some pretty interesting things from the instructor perspective. Um, one thing that comes to mind is that, you know, our data, particularly uh, when we're looking at quiz data, particularly when we're looking at end of course data, these are uh, themes that we can really benefit from in, in kind of revamping content, curriculum, how we approach quizzes and so forth. Um, yet we are a, a bit limited because those are by nature given to us by completers, right? And so the kind of the advent of the MOOC is that we have maybe a lot of missing data here from folks who um, perhaps there are folks who are genuinely interested in trying to complete but experiencing some obstacles and then don't and we're missing all of that data on why. And so I think while my response is I guess kind of 
not specifically to the, the data that we have, it's, it's connected in a way because there's some data that I think we would love to have about how do we reach the broad range of our students. And yes, absolutely, I, I think we're all pleased that the completion rate is higher than the typical MOOC completion rate, but I think there's certainly a lot of room for improvement moving forward as well. Um, it seems to be um, interesting module to module to see uh, engagement patterns. Um, I think there's a lot of excitement and flurry at the beginning of the course. I know this wasn't something that we quite uh, looked into here, but I'm just, this is a little bit more of the instructor understanding of the discussion boards and so forth, um, and probably more typical for an online course in a MOOC. Um, we see kind of a little bit of a diminishing uh, engagement over the course um, as folks kind of get into the semester, quarter, whatever it is, and, and we believe they have, you know, additional responsibilities. Um, and so I'm always interested in like engagement throughout the course. Um, one of my modules, which uh, this connects with the quiz data, one of my modules was more about kind of like the statistical understanding of assessment, some pretty basic approaches to like data analysis. And we're not talking about anything more sophisticated than like frequency tables. Um, I mean, this is very, very intro stuff, but uh, our students continue to kind of struggle with some of those concepts. And so I'm interested in knowing like, how do we make, well, two questions come to mind. One, uh, what do, does like statistical and data analysis support for student affairs assessment professionals in general look like? And secondly, can we make things even more accessible so folks have the resources they need? Um, you know, in some sense, the conclusions we can make about supporting students across the university are limited in part by uh, how we're able to understand and interpret the data. And so, um, whereas a lot of our uh, course is conceptual, is about building the basics about assessment, you know, I am interested in some of those more technical components too. Um, I think in general, like it's exciting to see the number of folks who are participating, who are completing. Um, I think that um, makes me feel positive. I think all of us as instructors, we feel positive about the course moving forward. But we're also always thinking about ways to be innovative, ways to think about how to continue to improve content and reach, you know, uh, our audience in the best manner possible. So as we see that despite being the largest category of participants being kind of zero to 20% assessment responsibility, responsibility in their jobs, um, the disproportionate completion rates of folks with higher percentages of assessment responsibilities, um, it, it gets us thinking and, and I think conversations we're having is like, how do we expand so that folks who are coming in and maybe need kind of a very specific thing will have access to these materials even beyond the course. And so I think, you know, a lot of questions that come to mind are like, are there additional possibilities for us to build content that, um, is maybe outside of the course or is static in nature that people can access? Can we use the really great curriculum that we have here to even expand beyond reach more folks and reach the needs of folks in the way that they're kind of looking for it? Is the mode of our course kind of one that is fitting our audience well? So I maybe posed more just general reflections and questions than I did like thoughts and answers about these things, but um, those are some of the things I'm thinking about, Joe. Yeah. and. You know, picking up a little bit there, I think it's one of the, one of the historical things that that could be worth the the audience hearing is the origins of this course really stemmed from again the student affairs assessment leaders group recognizing that there's a lot of people in that zero to twenty percent category, people who have some assessment responsibility and have never been trained, don't have the 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 background in it and don't have any structured resources beyond books or beyond you know, paying to to attend a conference and you know thinking about the, the barriers that can come there uh, we we thought about some of the stickiest general aspects of assessment the assessment cycle and the process and the work and you know, chunked it out into these seven topics uh, that that formed the foundation of the course. We originally set out to just make these PDFs that gave an overview on the topic, talked about some barriers that you may experience, and then listed out some resources. But once we got all that content done, we realized that A, it was a lot of information, <laughs> and B, we wanted to think about how we could 
best engage people around that information because nothing we were putting together was, uh, you know, not to um, you know, downgrade the work we did, but nothing we put together was super unique or that you couldn't find somewhere else. Um, but we were trying to position in a way that would be approachable and engaging at, at multiple levels, both for an, uh, an introductory person to learn, for an intermediate person to kind of remind themselves of their, their experience, and for an experienced person to then go above that, right? And, and take that piece and expand on it, you know, at their campus, at their institution, knowing that this is um, a resource that's out there. We then had the good fortune of an opportunity to turn it into a course. And I give all that backstory because where we find ourselves as instructors, and, and we've been slowly kind of moving the needle uh, as we're getting feedback, but we're beginning to take more artistic license and educational license in pulling those pieces apart that were originally put together. And you know, I'll go back to module five, which uh, had that one, the, the, the one question that had the worst, the, the highest number of people getting it incorrect. Um, and one of the troubling things about module five is that it covers multiple pieces of information that we've been able to string together and we had a certain vision in mind of how it fit together. But over time, as we've looked at it, reflected on it, made tweaks, we've realized that you know, there, there certainly are some pieces of that puzzle that were kind of forced in. Uh, and maybe if we gave them more space to breathe, uh, people might be able to understand and retain them and engage with them better. And that's just been a bit of our process of, you know, we recognize that. And so we're addressing it, you know, like I made a video talking about, you know, just to further emphasize how these pieces hang together. Here's how we see that. Um, but also then further talking about how each of those individual pieces in that module uh, can, can be of value. But as we're going along, we're seeing these opportunities to, to do that type of expansion or separation and, and, and um, what that can look like. And to Ben's point, then as we do those things, what other resources do we have? Or maybe it's not that we need to redo the module and pull pieces out. Maybe we need to create more resources to further reinforce what's being discussed there. Um, and so that's been a thing that I think one, we've been discussing and engaging, and, and two, I think the the quiz questions and data speak to, because I think some of the areas where the, the questions were the worst are areas that we as instructors have thought about making the most changes in terms of the module, um, or we've made significant changes recently. And so then the, the questions are reflecting and making us wonder if um, those changes are best reflected in the, the questions we're then asking, or if there's still some kind of a disconnect. Um, I think also, as I said before, you know, we need to continue thinking about how we can best measure engagement with the course beyond just completion. And, and we, the great thing about a lot of our videos is that they're on YouTube, and so we can see how many people are access, uh, accessing them. We can also see the average time somebody's been um, viewing them, and that is some analysis we've done in the past. Um, we didn't do it this past year, but we did it last year in 2018, and that really helped inform us of seeing that the longer videos we had had more of a drop off from people. And so we then set out to shorten some of the videos as well as um, create any new videos we were creating. We, we kind of held ourselves to a tight couple minute window to, to best uh, maximize engagement from folks um, with the content. And so we continue to look at this data and, and balance it with the data we already have and, and our own ideas and interests of growing and expanding the course. Um, the good thing is we have a lot of the data and we, we have a lot of people part of um, SOL that are interested in seeing this, this course succeed and, and we are getting some good feedback through these surveys from people who take the course saying, I wish this would be an option, or I wish you know this could be something that's part of the experience because that's something I was missing or something that I wanted to have happen. Um, 
And so I think more than anything, uh, and part of a big purpose in doing this session was to share out and, and let people know that we are looking at that data, we are using it to, to make improvements and considering it for how the course can be better um, and uh, how more people can be aware of that, whether they took the course or not. So I will go to the next slide here to open it up for any questions, comments, concerns that people have. Okay, we must have done a good job <laughs> covering some questions and presenting information to folks uh, and uh, having some good dialogue here. And, and for others, this could just be good insight and information about more about the course, especially if they've not taken it or insight into our process after the course is over and, and what we do with the information and how we consider it for uh, improvement. Here is all of our contact information. And I did want to make sure and again, credit Renee for the hard work she did with the quiz data analysis. And there's her email address if anyone has specific questions to follow up there. And then not to steal your thunder, Elizabeth, but just um, to keep it simple, uh, we encourage you all to attend the next structured conversation that Saul's putting on. Um, the topic is self-care as an assessment pro. It'll be Wednesday, October 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern and the corresponding time wherever in the world you all are. I'll turn it to Elizabeth to share, you know, when um, registration information will go out. Yeah, so we the registration itself is already set up, uh, but we tried something a little bit different today and had registration, but also sent it out to the listserv. So we're gonna play around with that and maybe not do registration this time and just uh, send out our, a notification. Uh, if anybody has specific feedback uh, on, on which to do, um, then let us know, but we're gonna play around with that a little bit and um, as well as what platform. So this was our, um, first time doing a, using Zoom as a platform for this. And we're going to see um, what some of the different options and benefits are. So stay tuned. Thanks, Elizabeth. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, we finished a little early, so you have some, some time back in your day. I will stop the recording and wish you all a great Monday.